Ptosis or blepharotosis indicates drooping of the upper eyelid. This can either be unilateral or bilateral. While assessing a patient with ptosis, it is important to go through every aspect of its examination as is evident from this checklist. One of the first things to be seen is the lid crease. In patients with congenital ptosis, typically a lid crease is absent or a faint lid crease is seen. Patients with acquired ptosis usually have a well-formed eyelid crease. This crease is an extremely important surface marking. The distance from the highest point on the upper eyelid to the first most prominent lid fold is known as the margin crease distance or the lid crease distance. This is about 6 to 8 millimeters in men and between 9 to 11 millimeters in women. Ptosis is associated with a lot of lid measurements. Now it is important that all these measurements be taken with the patient looking straight ahead in primary gaze without flexion or extension of the neck and with the eyebrows relaxed, negating the action of the frontalis muscle. Now the distance between the lower eyelid margin to the highest point on the upper eyelid margin is called as the palpable fissure height, which has two components. The first being the distance from the central corneal reflex to the highest point on the upper eyelid, known as marginal reflex distance 1 or MRD1. Similarly, the distance from the central corneal reflex to the lower eyelid margin is called marginal reflex distance 2 or MRD2. And therefore, MRD1 plus MRD2 equals the palpable fissure height. It is important that the measurements be taken at the same sitting for both the eyelids such that a comparison can be done straight away. It is important to know the position of the normal upper eyelid. It usually covers the superior 2 mm of the cornea or the limbus on top. Ptosis measurements, especially in down gaze, are very important. Here are two patients with ptosis. The patient on the right, on down gaze, one can see that the palpable fissure height in the totic eye is lesser compared to the normal eye in down gaze. This is because the levator muscle is thinned out and stretched. As a result, it is able to travel that distance and it falls lower than the normal eyelid. In comparison, in down gaze, the palpable fissure height is higher or more than the normal eyelid in patients with congenital ptosis where the muscle is fibrose, contracted and infiltrated with fat. This can give an initial clue as to what the etiology is most likely to be. The next thing to know is the severity of the ptosis. Typically a difference of about 1 to 2 mm between the normal and the totic eyelid would indicate a mild amount of ptosis between 1 to 2 mm. Ptosis is considered moderate when the difference between the normal eyelid and the totic eyelid is about 3 to 4 mm. In ptosis more than 4 mm, it is considered to be severe. One of the most important measurements in the assessment of ptosis is that of levator function. This is done with the patient looking straight ahead in primary position, making sure that there is no flexion or extension of the neck. Also, the frontalis muscle should be relaxed. Now the patient is made to look down and a measurement ruler is placed alongside. The marking that coincides with the lid margin is noted. Now without moving the neck or the head, the patient is asked to use only his eyes to look upwards at the ceiling. And the marking that coincides with the upper eyelid margin is now noted. And the total distance that the eyelid has travelled in millimetres is the levator excursion. This levator excursion roughly translates to the levator function. An excursion of less than 4 mm is typically associated with poor levator function. 5 to 11 mm is fair levator function, 12 to 14 mm is good levator function and in normal individuals 15 mm and above is seen. Extraocular muscle assessment is also important. A Bell's phenomenon is usually checked by asking the patient to forcefully close their eyes and lifting up the eyelid to see the position of the cornea. The eyeball typically rolls upwards and outwards in patients with a normal and good Bell's phenomenon. Eyelid closure or presence of lagophthalmos should also be checked for. 
patients with lack of thalamus in ptosis preoperatively are at risk of exposure keratopathy. Myasthenia gravis is an important condition that can present as unilateral or bilateral ptosis at any age. Patients typically who give a history of variability in ptosis that may worsen in the evening associated with sudden onset diplopia and the presence of systemic symptoms such as difficulty in swallowing solids are all red flags that should point towards myasthenia gravis. These patients should have ice pack test in the clinic. Here an ice pack is placed over both eyes for two minutes and the ptosis is measured after that. An improvement of two millimeters or more in the palpable fissure height is considered to be a positive ice pack test. This ice pack test has a sensitivity of 90% and upwards. Marcus Gunn jaw winking phenomenon is something that is typically seen in certain cases of congenital ptosis associated with synkinesis. Here, moving the muscles of the jaw or swallowing or chewing causes the upper eyelid to flutter. This can be induced in pre-verbal children by giving them a piece of chocolate or candy to eat. One must always check for the Herring's law or the Herring's phenomenon in asymmetric bilateral ptosis. Now here on top, you can see that the right eye has moderate ptosis. This was corrected and after surgery of the right upper eyelid, mild ptosis of the left eyelid was unmasked. This should have been checked before surgery in the clinic such that the patient could have been counseled for a potential left eye surgery beforehand. There are multiple conditions where different systems in the body can be involved such as neurofibromatosis, blepharochalasis and chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia. Therefore, a detailed systemic history along with clear history of prior eyelid surgery, concomitant strabismus, the presence or the history of trauma should always be noted beforehand. Therefore, while assessing a patient of ptosis, one must carefully go through every aspect of assessment and examination such that a correct diagnosis can be made and the ideal management strategy can be planned. Checking for refractive error and amblyopia along with a detailed dilated fundus examination is a part of every patient's assessment. Thank you for watching.